This is the life. Unfortunately, it's not my life. And unless you've won the lottery, it's probably not yours either. The truth is, only celebrities get this kind of treatment day in and day out. But don't be jealous, because they are just as capable of behaving like total idiots as the rest of us. And on this show, I'm going to be highlighting some of their more inglorious moments and trying them out for myself to see if they're fun, dumb, or downright deadly. Coming up, Diana Ross, Keith Moon, Moby, and Jamie Theaston. Find out what happened when I tried to be a soul brother. I want to thank you. What the celebs asked phone box hookers to do. She was uh, very insulted. And why is this angry man making me laugh nervously? Think you back up, bro. <laughs> but first, check out what happened when I decided to investigate why the combination of swimming pools and cars is irresistibly attractive to rock stars. It's the great rock and roll stunt, driving your expensive car into the swimming pool. It even made it to the cover of Oasis's Be Here Now, and it was done by the great rock and roll wild man, the permanently wasted drummer for The Who, Keith Moon. Keith was wonderful. I mean, he was my best mate for years. He comes to the whiskey. That guy, ten minutes later, was on a stage with no clothes on. I said, what the fuck are you doing there, man? Keith Moon probably just dropped onto all fours and bit Steve McQueen's dog, drive the car into the hotel through the plate glass window. All of a sudden, they bump into Moon. He's got a rifle in his hand, a dressing gown on, a pair of Chelsea boots, and a Corvette. Hello, dear boy. Just doing a bit of shooting. He uh, decided that it'd be good fun to burst his waterbed. Keith jumped out in front of their car in full Nazi regalia. And a zest for life. He died in 1978 as a result of an accidental overdose. Although given the amount of booze and drugs he ingested on a daily basis, it was pretty clear that this was an accident just waiting to happen. I know what you're thinking. Maybe it's good that he died when he did, because there's no way he'd have been able to keep up that level of inspired lunacy. But is that true? Well, on this programme, we've never run shy of tackling the really tricky questions, especially if they involve breaking expensive bits of machinery. So we're going to recreate one of his most infamous adventures, and we're going to do it pipe and slippers style. Yes, by now, Keith would have been well on his way to a pension, and maybe living a much quieter life. Now imagine that this is an old people's home, and that my firm young body represents the rattled, brandy-soaked physique of Keith Moon as a pensioner. It's my birthday, and something exciting is about to happen. Keith was celebrating his birthday during the middle of the Who tour, and he was presented with a cake which was then destroyed in a food fight, and uh, when the people attempted to break up this fight, Keith uh, decided he was going to uh, drive off in a sulk and jumped into the nearest car, a Lincoln Continental, and drove it into a, the pool of the uh, hotel where the party was staged. Sadly, we couldn't afford a Lincoln, so we went for a slightly cheaper vehicle. This little baby is the Atlanta Cadmus. It packs an impressive amount of grunt under the seat, and it's got a top speed of six miles an hour. Mind you, the Speedo doesn't have numbers on. It goes from tortoise to hare. Frankly, it's speedy, it's dangerous. It's rock and roll. Of course, it may not be too long until we see some genuine rock and roll stars swapping their Ferraris for one of these babies. All those bands who made it big in the 1960s are now pushing OAP status, and many of them will end up in care. Perhaps it would be kinder to have them put down, like they do with old pets. However, before anyone knocks on Mick Jagger's door with a euthanasia kit, let's see how much fun our Keith Moon experiment is. Say the Atlanta Cadmus fell apart on impact. I have a look, an ejector seat. And that vehicle was not designed for any sort of submarine activity. And if that's the most fun you can have in a mobility scooter, I'm afraid I'm with Keith Moon. Hope I die before I get old. True. 
true or false? So, you think you know your celebrity gossip? Let's find out. Which one of these bikini babes is telling the truth about Mick Hucknall? When he was a teenager, Mick Hucknall tried to find out if he was gay by asking his best friend to stroke his privates. Mick's hair went prematurely grey at the age of 32, and now the record company make him dye it ginger because of the money they've invested in Simply Red. When Mick met the Queen recently, she asked him what he did. He said he was a fishmonger and had ended up for the reception by mistake. So what's it to be? Team gay experiments, simply dyed red, or royal fishmonger? <laughs> of course, it's the gay hand job. Yes, Mick did get a little bar curious as a young lad, but luckily for us, he didn't enjoy it and stayed straight as a die. Still to come, a brilliant party game involving your penis and we retrace the steps that led Jamie Theakston into a whole load of trouble. And now we pay tribute to a couple of star-crossed lovers who in many ways were the Romeo and Juliet of our age, except she wasn't very good looking. It was the greatest love affair of the century of all time ever. She was a blonde TV presenter who'd posed nude for Penthouse in a gentleman's club. I say, steady on, old gal. He was a sex-mad Australian. Uh -huh. Can he, Skippy? By day, she was a presenter on The Big Breakfast. And he topped the charts with In Excess, oh, allowing him to pull babes like Kylie Minogue. <laughs> but he wanted one thing more than beauty. He wanted filthy sex. <laughs> Paula was the girl to provide it. She had a boob job for him. Bigger, make him bigger. Called his penis the Taj Mahal of crotches and chose their daughter's name while addicted to heroin. Why, we could call the hat pin banana trouser leg. Mm, or crimson zebra Tahiti briefcase is nice. Can you hurry up, please? I, I've got a wedding at four o'clock. But their drug-addled happiness couldn't last forever. There's more in part two. <laughs> As his name would suggest, the maverick musician Moby has never been afraid to make a dick of himself. And usually, it's his dick that's got him into trouble. Yes, the small, bald musician whose album Play has sold an impressive 10 million copies, and almost as many cars, claimed to have discovered an unusual game to liven up those dull, A-list events. The rules are simple. You unzip your flies at a crowded celebrity party and see how many famous people you can brush up against with your old fella. Quite a famous game, Moby's Novel Touch. I think they got David Bowie. No, we've never. We've never had the pleasure <laughs> of playing Novel Touch with Moby. We're not entirely sure whether that actually happened or not. There's some evidence to suggest that he just made the story up to make himself sound a lot more interesting. Moby managed to notch up Madonna, Drew Barrymore and Kate Moss. But as I move in slightly less exalted social circles, I'm going to make do with ordinary, unsuspecting members of the LA public down on the beach. Unfortunately, TV guidelines mean I'm not actually allowed to put my penis up against other people. So we're going to use this able substitute. It's a, uh, it's a yellow squash vegetable. If I nip behind this wall, get it in place. I've never been so well equipped in the trouser department in my life. Hi. Time to find some friendly Americans to play knob touch with. Of course, I'm not going to tell them that. Excuse me, mate. Can I ask you a question for British television? OK, we're doing a thing about uh, hypnotism. I want you to look closely into my eyes. I'm going to try and suggest something to you, OK? OK. What I'm trying to suggest mm -hmm. is a type of vegetable. So look closely into my eyes. What can you think? Uh, carrot. Nearly. Damn, not quite. The story was working fine, but the vegetable wasn't. All in all, this game was proving much harder than I expected, because standing usually close to a strange man while fumbling below my belt isn't something I do often. After a little while, though, I got the hang of it and scored a couple of definite knob touches. Now I was getting very bold. This one touched for ages and he never even guessed. Well, I don't think he did. 
I thought we'd done pretty well, but the producer wanted me to have one more go before the light went. What a disaster. If I hadn't been so quick to hide it, he'd have seen it was just a large yellow squash. As it was, Brian from Brooklyn thought I really was molesting him with my cock. Oh, God. Brian, look at me close in the eye. Don't get distracted. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, where were you born, Brian? Brooklyn, New York. So you grew up tough? Hey, rough, Keep no, looking rough me in the eyes. Keep looking me in the rough eyes. Rough and violent. Right. Did you ever get into trouble? What's that? <laughs> Did you ever get into trouble? I think you should back up, bro. <laughs> Let's see that again so you can revel in my gay vegetable embarrassment. Did you ever get into trouble? What's that? <laughs> Do you ever get into trouble? I think you should back up, bro. <laughs> if you want to see how tough the neighborhood I came from, I think you should back up. <laughs> okay, All I right. beg your pardon. Uh, I would actually wash that down here, because you may get hurt. You okay. And, you and your crew. Well, apart from that one nasty moment with the fellow from Brooklyn, who thought I was actually trying to touch him with my private parts, uh, I think Moby has been vindicated. You can go right up to people, talk to them about anything under the sun, and have your penis, or in my case, a large yellow vegetable, hanging out of your trousers. And none the wiser. Coming up after the break, what really happened to Jamie Theakston at that brothel? And I go deep undercover when I try to change my race. And while you watch the ads, you can try to guess which famous person said this. I was doing like half an ounce of cocaine every three days, and I was drinking half a gallon of rum a day with 28 beers. I never had a problem, though. Still to come, Theakston and the Hooker, plus more on Paula Yates. Welcome back to the show that's got celebrities everywhere running for cover and expensive legal advice. Our quote before the break was from none other than Mr. Dennis Hopper. And coming up now, we've got a story about a tall, thin television presenter who got involved with a hooker. And no, it's not Angus Dayton. Some celebrities you've got to feel sorry for. One minute they're attending award ceremonies, playing in charity football matches and squiring beautiful actresses around town. The next, they're all over the Sunday tabloids because of one little visit to a brothel. Yeah, poor old Jamie Theakston. If it wasn't bad enough for your ex-girlfriend to create a national joke by telling everyone that you were hung like a hamster, you then get the nation reading about your kinky sex sessions over their cornflakes and face professional ruin. Jamie Theakston. Whiter than white. Very naughty boy. Squeaky clean. Children's television presenter. He was a single man. You know, he had no, no commitments and, you know, he wanted a bit of fun. If you're going to do it, you must, uh, if you've got any intelligence at all, you must think, well, there's a good chance I'm going to get called out. So how did it all happen? Well, it started on a cold Wednesday night in December 2001. Jamie and a chum had been drinking here in London, Soho. And after last orders were called, they decided to continue their fun elsewhere. Jamie and his friend got into a cab and asked to be taken to a late night drinking club. They ended up here. For all we and our lawyers know, this now may be the home of a respectable lady and her cat. Back then, however, it was a sex dungeon, and Jamie was in for a night he'll never forget. He went to this brothel on Green Street in Mayfair, which had a dungeon amongst its various uh, attractions, and paid for a number of sexual services. And while a sex act was being performed on him, one of the girls rushed in and took a picture of him. And a few weeks later, the story broke in the tabloids. And that did it for Theakston. When he tried to get a court injunction put on the story, the judge said it can't be considered a confidential matter if you have sex with a prostitute in a brothel. There is, however, still at least one question remaining over the events of that night. What exactly do the tabloids mean when they describe something as a sex act? Does 40 pounds buy you a blowjob? And relief, something kinky with chicken feathers and baby oil. I'm going to ring a few ladies at the night and find out once and for all. I wonder how much African style I'm going to get for 40 notes. That's all I've got. Can you give me anything for 40 quid? Anything at all? A kiss? She was, uh... Very insulted by my £40 offer. I just put the phone down. 
top class services from a top class model. Doesn't sound cheap. Let's see what we get for 40 notes. Well, she offered me something called French, but she wanted 50 pounds, and I am going to have to wear a cob top. Let's try some Scandinavian beauty. And she said 45 was the normal price, uh, but she might be able to squeeze me in, which sounds even more fun. Some great offers, but we were no wiser as to what Jamie got up to, and his agent wasn't any help either, which is a shame, because the story wasn't all bad news for his client. Remember that rumour about his tiny penis? Well, it turns out that Bella the Hooker, who, let's face it, has probably seen a fair few members in her time, reckoned he had inches to spare. So well done, Beeston's cock. True or false? Tara, Tammy and Jen have each got something to say, but only one of them is telling the truth about James Dean. James Dean was known as the human ashtray because he loved being burned with cigarette butts. After his death, the coroner discovered that James had only one testicle. Poor bugger. James was illiterate and learnt his lines by having an assistant read them to him. So, what's it to be? Illiteracy, one bollock, or human ashtray? It's Tara. Yes. The human ashtray was his nickname in his favourite Hollywood gay leather bars. And now it's back to the saga of Paula Yates and Michael Hutchins. And I dare say there'll be a few tasteless jokes about auto-asphyxiation. Sometimes the couple loved being photographed. At other times, they hated it. Especially when the tabloids turned on them after opium was found in a sweet packet at their home. Irritated by the press and by Paula's ex-husband, Bob Geldof, Hutchins fled to Australia. He threw himself into an orgy of sadomasochistic sex. Take it, Slay! Straight! One night, he went too far. After getting wasted on drink and drugs, he hanged himself in a bizarre sexual misadventure. Paula was devastated and soon died in circumstances that were just as weird. After buying dozens of miniature bottles of vodka, she injected heroin and choked on her own vomit. Yes, fame had claimed another tragic victim. But at last, she and Michael would be together forever. Unless heaven doesn't exist. In which case, they're fucked. Diana Ross. She was in The Supremes. She's had over 70 hit singles. She was even in the film The Wiz with Michael Jackson. So you'd be right in assuming she's made quite a lot of money. But not as much as she might have done. Diana Ross was interested in getting into advertising cosmetics and uh, she had a lot of meetings with Revlon, uh, all of which were going very well and the head of Revlon actually turned around to her and said, uh, I think you could be the new face for black women. At which point, Diana Ross simply got up and flounced out of the meeting. Everyone was completely confused. You know, why was she pissed off? Then one of her people gave the following explanation. Miss Ross is not black. Not in her mind, and not in the mind of any of the people who work for her. By not wanting to be pigeonholed as a black celebrity, Diana Ross missed out on a fortune, which I dare say is no great hardship when you've already got one. On this programme, though, it's down to me to test out the foibles of the famous. So could I, by sheer chutzpah alone, convince other people that I'm a different colour? First off, I popped over to Harlem to see if I could talk my way into an all-black gospel choir. In this environment, it wouldn't just be my pale skin I'd have to explain away, but also my total lack of rhythm. Certainly, one or two of them soon began to notice that there was a honky in the woodpile. All right. Oh, thank you. You all singing, and it sounds pretty good, but you just don't look thankful. Lord, I just want to thank you. Okay. Lord, Lord, I just want to thank you. Okay. Lord, I just want to thank you. I could tell they were impressed because they started calling me brother. Brother Grubb said he couldn't sing, but he can hold a note. Only advice I can give Brother Grubb is uh, just give it your all. I want to thank you. 
Well, I thought I'd done okay. Time to see if I could convince them I was black. So, as a black man, I'd find it easier to be to be in the choir than uh, than a white, if I was a white man. I don't think so, because I would hope that we would be men enough and that we'd be Christian enough to accept you or whoever it was for who they were, regardless of the color of their skin. Well, nice sentiment, but Pastor Gregory clearly thought I was white as snow, so I decided to up the ante and have another crack at it. This is Oakland, California, home of the notorious Black Panthers. In the 60s, they were armed black activists, very anti-white power and the meanest mothers on the block. David Hilliard was one of the founding members, but would he let me join? I tried to show my credentials by enthusiastically taking part in his tour of Oakland. But right here in this alley is where little Bobby Hutton was killed. He was shot 27 times. Of course, the Panthers now shun violence, but would they notice if I called myself black? As a black person, what can I do, as it were? Well, I think that you can spread the information that you can expose to this general. Easy Ozzy. He never missed a beat. Uh, the struggles that the Irish have. So there you have it. If there's a cosmetics company out there who want me to model their range of makeup for white guys, then I'm sorry. Just tell them Brother Grub is hanging with the Panthers these days and he doesn't consider himself white. All, All power, power to, to the, the people. people. So that's the end of another show, and it's time for me to rest my bruised and battered body, not to mention my deeply traumatised soul. But if you enjoyed the programme, don't fret, because next time we've got plenty of this. Richard Pryor did it, so I'm setting my head on fire. Well, you're beginning to lick around my face now. Robert Mitchum did it, so I'm testing games you can play with your penis. Oh! And John Lennon Let's did it, so I'm getting punched oh. in the head <laughs> while wearing a tampon. <laughs>